No matter how formidable a tank is, it cannot fight alone. Long and bitter experience has taught us that without close infantry support, tanks can just be sitting ducks. In this video, we're going to look at how this simple fact has driven the development of the battle taxi, the means by which the infantry can be transported across the battlefield to be in the right place at the right time. We'll look at mechanisation and the birth of the armoured personnel carrier and how it's evolved into the infantry fighting vehicle of today. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. Now this is an absolutely huge subject. We can't hope to cover everything. So we're not looking at wheeled vehicles, for instance, and we're not looking at variants. Uh, but if there is anything you'd like to hear more on, please leave a comment below. The vulnerability of tanks going alone is illustrated at a very early stage. The tremendous success of the Battle of Combray in November 1917 is brought to a halt as the tanks advance up the ridge towards the village of Flecquier. Having penetrated the Hindenburg Line defences, the tanks came under fire from German field artillery positions as they moved up the slope. Their supporting infantry hadn't kept up and the tanks were alone. Whether this was due to fatigue, difficulty in crossing the terrain and wire on foot, or because they'd been told to keep their distance from the big metal bullet magnets, we really don't know. But we do know that had they been there, they would have been able to silence the guns and the slope below Flecquier would not have been littered with quite so many blazing tank hulks. Clearly, there was a need for a vehicle that could carry troops and keep pace with the tanks. The result was the Mark IX, affectionately known as the Pig, and the world's first purpose-built armoured personnel carrier. This is a development of the Mark V tank. Uh, it has a crew of four, two Hotchkiss machine guns, and it can carry up to 30 infantrymen or eight tonnes of supplies. So looking at this, you have got a degree of protection and you can M-bus and D-bus infantry quickly. We've sort of established the principles of the armoured personnel carrier. Inside, it's very much no frills. It's a big steel box. There's no seating, but it does have eight rifle loopholes on either side. Only about 30 of these were built, so the Mark IX didn't really make a serious contribution. The Mark IX was only capable of doing three and a half miles an hour, but that really didn't matter because that was the same speed of the tanks of the period. Things would change rapidly in the 1920s and 30s. During World War I, the tank is effectively just an infantry support weapon. But in the interwar period, with increasing mechanization, and developing technology, it becomes far more than that. It develops into a hard-hitting, fast-moving weapon of exploitation. British Army's Experimental Mechanised Force was set up in 1927 as a brigade-sized unit intended to test ideas and see which might point the way to the future of armoured warfare. This involved combined operations involving tanks, armoured cars, mobile artillery and aircraft. Vehicles used included light and medium tanks, tankettes, carriers, self-propelled artillery, the birch gun, and the Dragon Tractor, a tracked artillery prime mover. The element that was missing was infantry. Now, a lot of the EMF's advocates didn't see a role for infantry on a modern mechanised battlefield. So initially, the force only includes a small number of machine gunners. Later, there is an infantry component, but it's kept fairly small and it's truck mounted. So mobility is limited. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's a step back from the Mark IX of the First World War. 
Whilst companies such as Thornycroft were producing wheeled vehicles with impressive cross-country ability, the appearance of the Citroen Kigress half-track, which was used in limited quantities by the EMF, would go on to influence the design of the two most successful APCs of the coming war. The German general staff, the Oberkommander der Wehrmacht, built on the ideas originated by the EMF, and they also synthesized those with the Soviet concept of deep battle. They came up with their own doctrine, and this is the one that would popularly become known as Blitzkrieg. They realized that infantry would need to operate with tanks, and the infantry would need a specialized vehicle to carry them. The vehicle they came up with was the SDKFZ-251, um, this one. It's better known as the Hanamag after its principal manufacturer. Um, as you can see, it's a half-track, and that gives you a big advantage in that it's easy to drive. Uh, if you can drive a truck, you can drive a half-track, because it's got a conventional steering wheel. It's a good platform with a good turn of speed, 55 kilometres an hour. It has quite a long length of track, which means effective weight distribution, but it does have the Schachtelaufwerk overlapping road wheels. This does aid weight distribution, but they're prone to get jammed with frozen mud, particularly in the Rasputitsa period of winter on the Russian front. The vehicle has a light armoured superstructure, it's between 6 and 14 mil, and there is a pintle mount up on the top for an MG34 or 42. Uh, to provide a bit of fire support. But the fundamental thing to remember is this is not designed as an assault vehicle. It can do that, but its fundamental job is a battle taxi to deliver its dismounts to where they're needed. The vehicle has uh, twin rear doors and it is open topped. This gives you advantages in terms of situational awareness, and it's also possible to dismount that way, uh, but it does mean it's vulnerable to plunging fire from things like mortars, thrown grenades, that sort of thing. The fundamental problem was that there were never enough. And the Schützen, later called Panzergrenadiere, the infantry that the SDKF said 251 was designed for, more often than not had to rely on lorries with much lower cross-country mobility and no armour protection. The US Army's M3 half-track is similar in form and function to the Hanamag, but it's closer mechanically to the Citroen Kigress original. Uh, it wasn't particularly well liked. Six to 12 mil armor doesn't give you a lot of protection. And actually the open top is even more of a liability than that on the Hanamag. But it was produced in huge numbers. The M3 plus its variants like this one, which is a British M9, uh, there are about 38,000 of those and they are used in every theatre of war and in a whole host of other conflicts post-war. The British Army didn't build APCs during World War II, so British troops uh, either had to use M3 half-tracks acquired from the Americans via Lend-Lease, universal carriers, and they weren't ideal, they're too small, you couldn't fit an entire infantry section in one, or things like this. Uh, this is a kangaroo, and that's a concept that comes from the Canadians. They are basically adapted AFVs, and this one is adapted from the Canadian ram tank, minus its turret, so this is a ram kangaroo. They did the job after a fashion, but dismounting under fire through that hole where the turret used to be must have been hazardous in the extreme. As most people will know, the Soviets didn't even go that far. Why build APCs when you can just build more tanks? Consequently, T-34s are covered in grab handles. The role of tankoi descent, literally tank jumpers, was horrifically dangerous, but swarms of Soviet infantry, frequently armed with a Papa Shah submachine gun, rode tanks into battle. It's worth noting here that tank riding wasn't designed for long distance transport. It is just a battlefield tactic, albeit a very risky one. I mean, the casualties amongst tanko e descent must have been enormous, but it did work. The 
brief peace following World War II quickly gave way to the Cold War. Two rival power blocks, NATO and the Warsaw Pact, facing off across the inner German border. This gives way to a technological race, and this produces the main battle tank. Bigger, tougher, faster, and able to cover greater distances than anything that's been seen before. A new generation of carriers was required, one that could equal the MBT's cross-country performance, whilst offering its passengers some protection from the added threat of nuclear, biological and chemical warfare. The concept of the armoured personnel carrier comes to maturity in the period we call the Cold War. This is a good example. This is the British Army's FV-432. The space in the back for uh, a full infantry section, eight guys and all their kit, crew of two, and also op offers the same NBC protection as something like the Chieftain main battle tank. There are no gun ports. Access to the interior is via this heavy steel door. FE-432s were effectively being phased out in favour of the warrior for infantry use during the 1980s. But military commitments in Afghanistan and Iraq saw around 900 upgraded with a new engine and improved armour, amongst other improvements. This variant became known as Bulldog, which is still in service now, with a number being sent to Ukraine. Very similar in appearance to the FV-432, this is the US Army's M113, and this is one of the most important and influential AFVs ever built. It entered service in 1961, and it's one of the first vehicles to use purely aluminium armour. This gives even the up-armoured M113A3 from the 1980s a weight of just 12.3 tonnes, making it air-portable and air-droppable via a C-130 aircraft. It's also highly mobile, the 275 horsepower Detroit diesel engine giving a speed of 67 kilometres an hour. The M113 has a crew of two, and there's space in the back for between 11 and 15 passengers, and these are usually infantry dismounts. And the dismounts leave via this powered ramp. Up on top, uh, there's a pintle-mounted Browning M2 50 caliber machine gun, operated by the commander. Um, you can use that for a little bit of fire support, but it's mainly for self-defence. This is not primarily an offensive vehicle. When M113s were deployed to Vietnam, problems arose when the South Vietnamese Army, the AVRN, used the vehicles almost as amphibious light tanks. Casualties were high amongst the unprotected M2 gunners. 14 an engagement at Ap Bac in 1963 alone. Improvised armour was added, and after some work, this morphed into the ACAV, the Armoured Cavalry Assault Vehicle, with a 50 cal and up to four M60 machine guns. This is where the distinction between APC and IFV comes in. Do you want the vehicle to act as troop transport or to actively engage the enemy? Or both? Enter the infantry fighting vehicle. The first real IFV would come from the other side of the Iron Curtain, the Soviet-designed BMP-1. The BMP-1, Boevaya Machine Pekoti, which means infantry fighting vehicle, came from a design spec requiring a vehicle combining the abilities of an APC and a light tank. The vehicle would be amphibious, NBC shielded and able to fight alongside tanks. Its complement of infantry would be able to fire from inside the vehicle in contaminated conditions, or dismount. The BMP has a boat-shaped hull that makes it amphibious, like just about all Warsaw Pact armour. Uh, in the back, there are space for eight infantrymen, eight dismounts. Each one of those has got a rifle port with a ceiling collar. I can't imagine those were much use. Uh, the arcs are really not great, so I don't know how you'd hit anything. And then coming right round to the back of the vehicle, the back doors are fuel tanks. Now, the thing about these, they've been pointed out as a potential hazard, but the idea is they just increase road mileage. So with a bit of luck, by the time you go into combat, these things are empty. But it's when you actually start looking at the top of the tank, 
you see the real difference, the thing that marks the BMP out as a proper IFV. There's a squat turret mounting a 73 millimeter Grom low velocity smoothbore gun. Uh, and there's also a rail for a Saga A anti-tank missile. In combat, the semi-automatic Grom would provide fire up to 700 meters with a Saga having a range of 500 to 3000 meters. So this would make a real contribution in an anti-armor engagement. I think there's no doubt that if it had ever come to it uh, in a war between Warsaw Pact and NATO forces, the BMP would have made a real contribution. A subsequent redesign into the BMP-2 saw the vehicle up-armoured and up-gunned to increase protection and combat versatility, with the later generation BMP-3 improving on this still further. But with well over 20,000 BMP-1s produced between 1966 and 1981, there are still large numbers in the inventories of armies around the world, including those of Russia and Ukraine, hence their regular appearance in news footage of the current war. The current range of IFVs in service includes the American M2 Bradley and this one. This is the British FV510 Warrior. The Warrior was designed as a faster replacement for the FV432 because this is a time when main battle tanks are getting faster and you need something that can keep up with them. Um, at the same time, they decided to upgrade the armour protection and the firepower, so they've actually created the British Army's first true IFV. Powered by a Perkins Condor V8 engine, the 25-tonne Warrior has got a top speed of over 46 miles an hour. It's got a crew of three, and then in the back, space for seven infantrymen dismounts. Main armament is a non-stabilised 30mm Radovan cannon with a Hughes 7.62mm chain gun. In keeping with British doctrine that the infantry fight dismounted, there are no firing ports. This also has the advantage of making it easier to fit a plique armour, including ERA and slat armour. Warrior has shown good protection from small arms fire, RPGs and anti-tank mines, most of the casualties suffered by British soldiers in Warrior being caused by large IEDs in Iraq and Helmand. A thorough upgrade involving a replacement for the ageing Radon cannon has been abandoned. Currently, Warrior is instead likely to be replaced by Boxer in the next few years. The battle taxi has come a long way from the Mark IX, World War I, to the half-track vehicles, World War II, the APCs of the Cold War, and now the IFV of today. Change has been driven by two things, technology, and operational requirements. Technology saw the birth of the tank and the APC at much the same time. And the operational requirement is very much in evidence on the ridge at Flecquier. The interwar period sees the need for a light, fast, efficient of moving infantry around on a mechanized battlefield. During World War II, the half-track seems to fulfill that need. With the advent of the MBT and the potential use of nuclear, biological, chemical weapons on the battlefield, APCs have to be, become faster and they have to provide their crews and passengers with more protection. But increasingly, they're being used in a more offensive role. And that gives rise to the advent of the IFV, the Infantry Fighting Vehicle. But one common thread remains the same the vital concept of infantry and armour cooperation. Do hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please subscribe. And if you can, please support us on Patreon.